Welcome to the second lecture on foundations of cognitive robotics. In the last class, I talked about a basic introduction of cognitive robotics, where I told you that what is the source or inspiration of these term cognitive and how cognitive robotics is different, is unique from other branches of robotics. I also told you, if you remember, that what are the different types or characteristics of interactions that are possible in a robotic system in order to develop an intelligent robotic system. And we have made these graduations from strong to weak artificial intelligence, strong to weak AI. Like for a strong AI system, I told you that embodiment is not a precondition. You can have simple coupling, you can have historical coupling with the environment and that will be good enough for a strong AI system. Whereas for a weak AI system, where we are talking about things like cognitive robotics, physical embodiment is very much required. Now there are two subcategories under physical embodiment, which are organismic embodiment and organoid embodiment. And I will talk about these different types of embodiments in this particular lecture. Also, I will tell you that how we can develop such cognitive robots using certain special class of materials called smart materials and thus we will be able to build up organismic robots and there will be a hope of developing cognitive robots through that. So, in this second lecture on foundations of cognitive robotics, we will focus on organismoid embodiment. Okay? So, uh, all other couplings, the structural couplings or historical embodiment and the very futuristic embodiment which is organismic embodiment, these are the things which we will not focus at this moment, organismoid embodiment which is the basic requirement for a cognitive robotics will be in the focus first. Now, when we will talk about organis organismoid embodiment, what is it that comes into your mind first? Remember, in our last lecture, I have shown you a small video from Honda on the performance demonstration of a robot which is a humanoid robot that is the ASIMO robot. Now this particular robot how do you classify it? Would you classify it to be an organismoid robot? And if you classify this to be an organismoid would not it be a good idea to actually look into that how much humanoid organ like you know it is basically developed in the light of developing a human like robot. So, how much human like is this particular robot? So, let us look into Honda specifications and let us see that how much human like is this ASIMO robot. So, we will talk about the building blocks and in this direction let us look into what goes into the ASIMO robot. Now, Honda engineers have created ASIMO with 34 degrees of freedom. This 34 degrees of freedom essentially means that there are 34 independent ways in which the ASIMO robot can move its different limbs or body parts. 
and that actually helps it to walk and perform many tasks much like a human exactly not like a human but much like a human you have seen in the last class in the last video that i have shown that how it was delivering a glass of drinks to the lady now this asimo apart from the fact that it is made of 34 degrees of freedom structurally it is made of a lightweight material which is a magnesium alloy structure and it is combined with powerful computers and it is these two combinations that means by choice of a lightweight material and by choice of this 34 degrees of freedom we are able to see the performances of the asimo robot well you may be interested to know that in comparison to the asimo robot what are the degrees of freedom to a real human and then only we'll be able to understand judge the performance of asimo robot if you find out that how many degrees of freedom are there in human you will see that for example our head in the neck joint it can have three independent movements up or down left or right and a rotation so it has three degrees of freedom similarly in the shoulder it has again three degrees of freedom the elbow joints have one degree of freedom the wrist joints in comparison have much higher degrees of freedom seven degrees of freedom in each one of the wrist so for the two wrists that will make it 14 degrees of freedom maximum number of degrees of freedom is there on the fingers that's why our fingers you know the in comparison to asimo's asimo looked like so much like a robot because if you look at our these fingers we will be having 13 degrees of freedom uh, in each hand so that means total 26 degrees of freedom then the hip is having two degrees of freedom the crotch joint in the leg is having three degrees of freedom knee joint one degree of freedom and the ankle joint will be having six degree of freedom each which means two ankle joints will give you 12 degrees of freedom so in all it is about 57 degrees of freedom so compare our 34 degrees of uh, our 57 degrees of freedom to the asimo robots 34 degrees of freedom and you would be able to know that how much steel we have to achieve in the robotics. There is also some more thing to compare. How about the weight of the ASIMO robot with this 34 degrees of freedom? And how much of power it requires? Let's go back to the uh, specifications of the Honda robot and let's check that. If you look at some interesting specifications of ASIMO, which I gathered from the Honda's website, its height is about 4 feet 3 inch. It is just like the height of a child. Weight is 50 kg. Well, that is little high in comparison to a child. Walking speed and running speed is slightly in the higher side as we can see. 2.7 km per hour. Walking speed and running speed is about 7 km per hour. Grasping force, little bit in the lower side about 0.5 kg or 500 gram per hand I am sure that a kid can lift slightly more weight than 500 gram actuator wise this 34 degrees of freedom comes in the expense of 34 servo motors in fact that's what gives the maximum cost to this robot and the control unit is having uh, the working and operating control unit, wireless transmission units, etc. It has sensors, for example, in the foot. It has torso level sensors in terms of gyroscopes and acceleration sensors. And again, the negative side is the power. It needs a 51.8 volt lithium ion battery. It's very, very substantial. Also, lithium ion battery is quite dangerous under wet condition. And the operating time that we get, 
that is also very low if you look at it is just one hour so at the operation system is you know workstation or a portable controller so what we can figure out from this specification is that there are at least three points in which asimo is still far far away from a, a good organismoid robot one is in terms of of course the degrees of freedom it has 34 degrees of freedom whereas the organ or the you know in nature the human that it mimics that has 57 degrees of freedom and it has a substantially high weight is more than 50 kg in spite of using very advanced class of materials also it needs a very high power and it can work only up to an hour or so so these are some of the limitations of the best currently available robot which is close to an organismoid robot so all these things what does it point to what does it lead to it tells us that we need to improve in terms of the overall weight or the bulkiness of the robot and also in terms of the overall power consumption of the robot so what is the solution in front of us if we look into the new developments of muscles in this new age we will see that there is a new branch of robotics fast expanding which is also known as soft robotics now under soft robotics the robotic arms are meant to stretch and squeeze at every point along their length and their movement cannot be described with simple geometric relations because it is too complex it's a large deformation motion much unlike the way we are used to do it let's say for a rigid robot system with the help of kinematic chains it's very difficult to describe this kind of a flexible robotic link with this type of robotic system so here you can see a octobot or a octopus morphology you know kind of thing which is mimicked in an octobot system now one of the thing if we compare between the robots and the animals we would see that robots traditional designs of steels etc is far far stronger than any natural naturally living material let's say the nearest will be the teeth or the necker and if you go for softer materials like say wood or ABS plastic then possibly it will be closer to the cortical bones or a squid beak if you make your robot even softer like high density polyethylene or polytetrafluoroethylene or polyurethane then you will come closer to cancellous bones ligaments tendons etc if you can make your robot farther soft like say silicon rubbers then you will get some of the muscles like cardiac muscles and even in a softer range almost close to hydrogels you will start to get the skeletal muscles so thus this uh, you know comparison is amply telling us that the direction to which we have to take our soft robotics but is weight is the only concern no we have to also keep in our mind that we have a concern of the power we have the concern of this so many number of servo motors which makes it you know very very expensive to afford now you look at the different variations of soft robots like uh, this one is a caterpillar inspired locomotion and then a multi gate quadruped robot again based on soft material an active camouflage one you can actually play with meta materials and optical optically coupled properties to develop active camouflage walking in hazardous environments type of robots and then worm inspired locomotion in robots and then 
particle jamming based actuation, rolling powered by a pneumatic battery and hybrid hard, hard and soft robot kind of combinations and then we have this snake inspired locomotion jumping powered by internal combustion then there is a manta ray inspired locomotion and an autonomous fish all these are various types of soft robots that are coming up very fast and with the intention that how we can reduce the weight of the robot but also as i told you that functionally you need to improve you need to replace these classical servo motors in order to make it more sustainable, feasible, low power consuming, etc. So, we need to think of the development of muscle based flexible robots. The first stage towards that is the development of pneumatic artificial muscles or PAMs, and these PAMs were the first step where the air pressure is used in terms of compressing and getting a muscle like motion from the system. Now, however, the compressor itself is quite heavy weight. So, we need to change from a compressor based system to let us say a solid state kind of actuator system. And one of the very interesting candidates towards this is uh, ionic polymer matrix composites or IPMCs. These are a general class of electroactive polymers. Like here you can see a four finger electroactive polymeric gripper which can grip up to the extent of 10.5 gram of rock and this is used by NASA in a EAP gripper for uh, you know extra outside the earth uh, in uh, one of the planets planetary missions to collect the debris. I can show you that how this EAP would work you can see that such a large deformation you are getting from the electroactive polymers and then how each one of the four fingers have to work together the last deformation and then they have to grab the object which is quite you can see that it has, to, it has deformed a lot so that is something without the use of any motor is really challenging just by deforming it with the help of direct transformation of electrical energy to mechanical energy and then placing it at a different location. You can do much more complicated works with the help of this kind of IPMC rockers. Today we have even more interesting group of materials which can perform amazing fits and they can be easily embedded and integrated in order to form actuators which would go very well with soft robotics and can really make our dream of developing cognitive robots. These are the groups of materials which are known as smart materials. Now before we talk about such smart materials, we have to keep in our mind that the mechanisms also has to be made compliant. For example, here you can see that uh, these, uh, this is a gripper and the gripper ends you can see a large deformation you can make with the help of these uh, closing down between the two. Now what here has been done using the fingers can be also done with the help of smart materials and then you can actually get a very large deformation. So even though the smart materials can be used at the back end in order to get a large amplified motion, you need to make such contraptions of compliant mechanisms for grippers. Now let us talk about the smart materials. In this group of materials, the features of such materials are that they are basically functional in nature and the basic energy forms that gets interchanged in such materials are between thermal energy to mechanical energy, between electrical energy to mechanical energy, magnetic energy to mechanical energy or sound energy to mechanical energy. As I told you earlier also that energy can only be transformed. So in this case we have to manipulate between these transformations in order to get our intended 
type of actuations or type of sensing. Now this material's behavior, which is why they are so much important for soft robotics is that they are analogous to biological materials, like they have the nature of adaptivity, cellular function, self-sensing, actuation and control. And moreover, these sensors and actuators are highly embeddable. So as different energy forms are interchanged in a smart material, let us look into these different types of smart materials from an input-output classification point of view. There is a broad group of smart materials like piezoelectric, in this case the input is electrical energy and the output is mechanical deformation, mechanical energy. And then we have magnetostrictive materials where the input is uh, for a user for the group of ferromagnetic materials the input is magnetic energy and the output is once again mechanical energy in the form of mechanical stress and deformation. And then for shape memory alloys it remembers its original shape after being deformed and it can go back to the original shape. So this uh, is by actually exploiting the change from thermal energy uh, to mechanical energy. And we also have some special groups of rheological materials which are like electromagnetorheological materials where it is the viscosity that changes in the material. So thus there are these different types of materials and if we look at these from an input output point of view. The inputs can be categorized in terms of electric field, magnetic field, stress, heat or light for that matter, even light can be used as input and outputs can be in terms of charge, magnetization, strain, temperature and light. Now if you look at these, let us say like in a matrix form, then the diagonal terms are something which are the material properties which is very common in material. So they are not very smart properties, but it is the off diagonal terms, particularly this green row column and this grey row which is of very useful nature to us. For example, electric field as an input and as an output it is creating strain is what is known as reverse piezoelectricity. That is what is used in piezoelectric materials or even in the IPMC example that I have shown you a few minutes before. And this is one such kind of an off diagonal property of a smart material. Similarly, if you can achieve the deformations using magnetic energy, then it is called Zule effect magnetostriction. So this is also another off diagonal term. For heat, for the shape memory alloys, it is thermal. Uh, you know thermally induced phase transition and for light it is photostriction. Now this green column this is corresponding to the actuator development. Many of these materials can be also used as sensors and here this grey row is very important like if you use for example stress as the input mechanical stress and by exploiting the direct piezoelectric effect, you can build up a sensor which will give you current or charge as an output. Similarly, using Villari effect in some materials, you can get magnetic field change, magnetization change as an output. Change of stress creating strain is a very normal thing of elastic modulus, there is no smartness. In it. But if I change the stress and if the temperature changes, there is a thermomechanical effect that is related to it. And similarly, if the electric property changes, there is a photoelastic effect which is also equally interesting in terms of developing sensors. Now, if you compare these materials in terms of actuators and compare them with the traditional actuators like motors, like pneumatic actuators or hydraulic actuators. We are interested to know that in which way smart materials are actually better, in which way these smart material based actuators will be 
outstanding in comparison to all the traditional actuators. If you look at the response times, you can see that all these greens are the traditional actuation system, which is in terms of seconds or milliseconds. And here, for smart materials, you get it in terms of 0.1 milliseconds, which is even one tenth of a millisecond. And that shows that why they are very fast, so their response time is faster. That makes them closer to this kind of organismoid robots. And also another interesting property is their accuracy. If you look at their accuracy, they are far more accurate than most of these actuators that we are talking about. At least 10 to 100 times more accurate these smart materials are. So in terms of the speed, in terms of the accuracy, they are, you know, an order or several orders of magnitude better than the traditional actuators. Now, the flip side is that the displacement is lower or the force is also lower, but these two things you can actually compensate by using suitable mechanical amplifiers or by distributing the actuators, the smart material based actuators, uh, you know, in terms of just like our muscles, you can distribute it and you can extract more energy from the system. Now, if you look at the piezoelectric materials, because in this talk, I today's lecture, I mostly focus on piezoelectric materials. As you can see here that if I apply force and if I deform the piezoelectric material, you are getting a voltage that is produced in the system. So this is what is the reverse piezoelectric, uh, is, uh, is, is the direct piezoelectric effects where you are applying the force mechanically and you are getting the voltage out of it. If we look at these piezoelectric materials closely, we will first see that they are not that very new. It was developed around 1880. As you can see that Pierre and Jack Curie has developed the first actually found out this piezoelectricity, which is basically electricity from pressure. And Contemporary electricities were like electricity from static electricity from friction, which was a contact electricity, or electricity by heating up crystals, which was pyroelectricity. So, when they found out that even pressure in a crystal can generate electricity, this piezo means pressure, that's where this new group came into picture. And as a result of that, Pierre Cui and Paul Zach Curie, both of them got Nobel Prize in Physics in 1903 on the direct piezoelectric effect. The direct effect signifies if you apply pressure on the piezoelectric material, you are getting electricity out of it. Similarly, at a later stage, Gabriel Lipman theoretically predicted that the reverse is also possible. If you apply electric field, you will get a mechanical deformation for which he got his Nobel Prize in 1908. That's on the reverse piezoelectric effect. Now, why piezoelectric material is so exotic? What is there so special in a piezoelectric material that actually give it this property that as you apply the mechanical force, you are getting an electrical charge out of it. Well, one of the very important group of piezoelectric material are these perovskites, named after a Russian geologist, which was discovered roughly around 1950 or so. And these perovskites are generally a ternary structure, that means it is made of three components, like in this example, barium, titanium and oxygen. So there are three components which forms this crystal, this piezoelectric crystal. Now what is so special about these components is that you, if you look at the structure, the crystal structure of this material, you would see that bariums are at the vertices of this tetrahedral, this tetragonal structure and you would see that the uh, 
uh, oxygens are at the face center everywhere and the titanium which is the source of this kind of piezoelectricity is deep inside the geometric center of this tetra. Now this titanium is very precariously positioned because if I apply a little bit force on this crystal from any direction, the titanium will get displaced from its center and the moment it will displace, as the titanium has a high degree of electropositivity, it will generate actually a dipole moment in this crystal and thus a little mechanical deformation the crystal is charged. And if you imagine that in any uh, bulk material there are hundreds or millions of crystals, each one of them will get charged because of this deformation. Although the dipoles could be random in nature and you need to electrode it to make it specially moving towards a particular direction, but those are the things I will talk about at a later stage. Now this is about the barium titanate structure. Similar piezoelectric effect you will be able to see in lead zirconate titanate, PZT, in lithium niobium family, in lead niobium family, in yttrium manganese family, and in ammonium cadmium family. The thing that would differ may be the Curie temperature. The Curie temperature tells us that beyond, beyond what temperature, beyond what temperature the piezoelectricity would not be uh, there, so the piezoelectricity would be absent in a system. So that's what is the Curie temperature, which we have to keep in our mind that you will not see the muscle, the artificial muscle that we are trying to build in action if the temperature goes a particular, beyond a particular level. Now, what is the constitutive equation of such piezoelectric structure? As I told you that for the direct effect where you are applying mechanical stress that is there in this large x, that x is the stress. So you are applying stress in the crystal means you are uh, you know, increasing x and as you are increasing x you will see that the charge is appearing in the system. Remember if you apply or increase the electric field then also there will be charge appearing but that's something which is pretty common, isn't it, for a capacitor type of a, you know, things like a dielectric material. So that's not what the smartness is. The smartness is where you are applying the mechanical stress and getting a charge out of it. Only a very few group of materials will show this and the degree up to which it will show is governed by this small d which is electromechanical coupling coefficient. The higher the D, the more will be the electric charge that will be generating in the system. How can we use this that you are applying stress and you are finding charge? Well, they have a great use in terms of development of sensors. So the direct effect is generally used for sensor development. Now for the converse effect, where you are applying the electric field now, not the mechanical field. Mechanical field creating small x that is the mechanical strain is quite natural for any material. But you are applying electric field and finding the mechanical strain. That's something new, isn't it? And that is what is the basic, uh, you know, equation that we will be using for developing these artificial muscles. And by applying electric field, mechanical deformations. And that is what is the converse effect or the reverse effect. The electrical stimulus creating the strain. Once again here you can see the same electromechanical coupling coefficient. That means the more I, the more the materials D will be, the more I will be getting the strain out of the same electric field. So these are the two very basic equations which will continuously guide us in terms of the development of actuators and sensors by using these two effects. I will now show you some applications of piezoelectricity. The first application as actuator is actually pretty common in terms of 
every day you might have seen it, you might not have noticed that is in printers. Say for example, if you look at this, you will see that that you are getting this axial deformation by using two materials, one smart, one non-smart, like these two things together, you can make a bending out of the thing. And this bending, you can actually put it in terms of controlling the flow of, you know, ink jet filter. So each one of them is actually pushing a droplet of a pigment which makes the filter. So this is one application. Another application is in terms of amplification of piezoactuator. So if you look at the piezoactuator here, the central part is where the actuation is taking place. And this actuation in the central part is very small. But because we have used a special egg-like structure, a little bit of deformation here can create a large deformation along the semi-minor axis of the ellipse, which is what is these amplified piezoactuators do. And look at the very last one. This is where the piezoelectric material is actually in an offset with a composite. Here also, because of this offset, by actuating this, you can get a large deformation out of the system. All these three things you can use some way or the other in terms of developing the actuators. So in this talk, I have told you about one basic block of a smart material, which is the piezoelectric material, and how this piezoelectric material can be used in terms of developing an actuator. And this actuator in turn can be used to replace those servo motors that I have shown you in that ASIMO and to make a robot more organismoid or organic like robot. There are many other smart materials and in next few lectures I will quickly cover some very prominent smart materials too. Thank you.